from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I first met David Remnick 22 years ago when he was just a wisp of a boy. I was something of a wisp myself, but I decided to call him up when I heard that he had just been made the Moscow correspondent for the Washington Post. He had come into that position out of nowhere. He had graduated from Princeton just six years before and gone to work for the Post as a night beat police reporter, I think it was, in time he graduated to covering the National Football League for the paper. But now he was studying Russian intently, and I, being an enterprising young editor at a New York publishing house, decided to introduce him to an author whose book I was about to publish, the very talented, irrepressibly dissident, devastatingly acute master of Soviet satire, Vladimir Voinovich. I invited David to lunch. We met at, I think it was Galileo's. Voinovich, who barely spoke English, took to David immediately. It was a chemical thing. David, who didn't know much Russian at the time, returned the compliment. They liked each other. They later became friends. It was clear that this nascent foreign correspondent was a bright and curious young man a reporter who watched and listened. And even at that early point of his career, it was clear he was a person who could look past current events to the deeper human issues that drive them. It's been a pleasure to watch David ever since. Obviously, he mastered Russian so expertly that he went on to cover the historic events in the crumbling Soviet Union with great sensitivity and insight. When communism collapsed, collapsed excuse me, and glasnost and perestroika surprised us, David Remnick was among the few who could explain them. Eventually, he wrote a very good book called Lenin's Tomb, which won the 1994 Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. He was only 36 years old. He had joined The New Yorker by then. For a while, he was a staff writer. Within six years, he succeeded Tina Brown as the editor of the magazine. In the interim, he has been credited with increasing circulation by 23% to more than a million readers. And he is loved by his writers and editors and the marketers on his staff, all of whom feel he lives only to please them. Writer, editor, and publisher, David has written six books and edited four more. How he does it is a mystery. Although Malcolm Gladwell, a New Yorker staff writer and a fellow book writer, once said, quote, he likes to pretend that it's no sweat. He cruises around and chats with people and then disappears and writes thousands of words in 15 minutes. It's all part of that make it look easy thing. When asked how he could possibly write a revealing book about Pre President Barack Obama and still run one of the most successful magazines in the country, his wife, a writer with the New York Times, said, quote, he got up really early, went back to work after dinner with the kids, and took no weekends off and no, va no vacations for more than a year. The result has been a fascinating book that describes our president as a man for all seasons, a flexible, mutable chameleon. As the, as the Post's reviewer for Book World, Gwen Eiffel of PBS described it, quote, Remnick efficiently strips some of the gloss of, off the version Obama offered in his best-selling 1995 memoir, Dreams from My Father, charitably and accurately describing that effort as a mixture of verifiable fact, recollection, recreation, invention, and artful shaping. Here to talk about that book and to illumine his theories and observations about our man in the White House is the author of The Bridge. Please welcome one of our most dynamic American journalists, David Remnick. I need to offer two corrections as a, I guess you, you, if you're an editor, you edit everything. I just, I'm extremely, pleased by and flattered by that introduction. Let me offer two corrections. One, 
I did not cover the National Football League, that, which, that would have been the Redskins. That was way too exalted for me. I covered the United States Football League, and that team was the Washington Federals, a, a, a league that you now uh, sadly forget. And um, the team went, I think, 2-14. and 14, And it rained every Sunday. And that was, that was my other thing. The other thing is the notion of the no sweat uh, business. I think we can all agree safely that this is the Schwitz capital of the world. <laughs> and let's give ourselves a little applause for enduring it. So. Um, I, and I want to thank all the organizers of this festival. I think you can't really imagine um, I think we can vaguely imagine why readers would want to come here and listen to Stacey Schiff or John Franzen or Will Haygood or whoever they happen to see in the, in the, in the last hours uh, with great enjoyment. But you have to know what it does for writers to see people that actually read, read you, uh, have things to say about these books, critical things to say about these books, complimentary things about these books. Um, reading is is a an extraordinary activity done in quiet and solitude. Uh, as John Franzen has said recently, you, reading is the one thing you can't do seriously and multitask. Um, occasions like this, though, uh, while not reading, uh, and maybe a secondary activity, are really important to writers once in a while to get out of the house and meet their readers. It does a lot for us, um, I know. And so I thank you for that. I want to just, I have just a few minutes that I want to talk about this book and maybe provoke um, a short discussion with you and let's see if I can manage to do that. I just, I should say a little bit about the origins of this book. The question that I get very often is Barack Obama wrote an autobiography. Um, yes, I know that. And, uh, and even an awfully good autobiography and, he, and a second book as well that has some virtues and, um, and also some, I think it was a utility book. But the first book is an actually a good book and tells a lot about his life. Why would you bother? writing a biography. Well, first of all, uh, autobiographies, memoirs, are stories that you tell about yourself. It has the point of view of your, your own point of view. You leave in and take out what you want to do, and you would no more consider a book on Ben Franklin authoritative if it was called the autobiography of Ben Franklin, um, as you would imagine it, 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 if it were written by the man in the moon. Ben Franklin is a book that requires all kinds of biographical scholarship and pressure from Brands and Schiff and all the many people who have concentrated on it from different angles. And an emerging political figure like Barack Obama, who makes use of his own life, the story of his own life, makes it into a political utility even, bears biographical, scholarly, and journalistic pressure that is not his own. So, the idea to do that book is, 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 is not something that really required a lot of thought, but I didn't know how much room there was for maneuver. Um, as an editor and as a friend of John Updike's, I went to his funeral uh, a couple winters ago. And on the way back from the uh, Massachusetts shore where this funeral take pl took place, very small service, I stopped in at Harvard Law School and spent a few days interviewing law professors and colleagues of Obama's just to see what there was to know. After all, the campaign had been going on for quite a long time. Many, many stories had been written, some by some very talented journalists. What was left over? And that little experiment proved to me that there was a story to tell, a story that hadn't been told, a story that required some depth. Um, Barack Obama, one of the chapters in, in The Bridge, and I, the, the, the book obviously is, is a biography and set against the background and context of the racial uh, uh, drama uh, of the nation's politics. And it, it takes in quite a lot, everything from Harold Washington and um, the politics of Chicago, the politics of Harvard Law School, uh, the history of Afri African Americans running for the presidency, many different kind of subplots in the course of the book. Um, I, but I, I also spend a, a, a chapter looking at Obama's own autobiography as a specimen of probably the richest uh, genre of African American writing, uh, and that is African American memoir. In other words, I wanted to see how this book, which was written in relative innocence, 
In other words, before he became a candidate, before that time when politicians write nonsense books about themselves and bland books about their uh, uh, political uh, policies and, and, and biographies that try to appeal to everybody all at once. This is a book written in relative in innocence and also out of a sense of literary ambition. The, re the origins of his autobiography come when a literary agent notices an article in the press that this guy has become the first African American uh, president of the Harvard Law Review. She asks him to write a book. He doesn't know what he's going to write. He thinks about writing a book about civil rights law and he happens upon his own story and writes it, just like Michelle Norris or any, any number of other uh, African Americans who have ventured into this genre. And I try to look at this book structurally, what it sets out to do, um, taking note of the fact that there are three parts to it. Each, each of them ends with the author in tears. Um, and it's structured apolitically. Uh, it's in a political context, but it is not a candidate's book. It does not take into account Obama's life in politics as he enters the world uh, of, sh of Chicago politics. So that was, that was how I set out writing this book. Um, I was, uh, had no interest in trying to play a catch-up game of writing about the Obama presidency. The book ends at the White House door, um, and it examines him, him uh, in all the regards prior uh, not only to the election, but even the campaign itself gets fairly short shrift compared to these episodes in Obama's uh, youth and childhood and his parents' uh, development. Um, I just want to say one thing about African-American autobiography, something that it has very, in a very generalized way in common and in common with Obama's own uh, book. If you look at African-American autobiography, a genre that begins with 6,000 6, slave narratives, I mean, the most famous of which is Frederick Douglass, but there are thousands of other ones. A genre that goes uh, straight through to the, to the great books of the 20th century. We know whether it's Richard Wright or Malcolm X um, or Maya Angelou. So many of them, they have certain things in common. Uh, a struggle for freedom, a journey from either incarceration or slavery or oppression or stifling, depending on the period of time and the historical circumstances, a, a, a journey that tends to be part of this, and a search for community, a search for a self, a search for a politics, and a search for a geography and a sense of purpose. All these things are present in Obama's autobiography. The book, over its some some reviewers have used the euphemism "exhaustive" to describe or to describe this book. What they mean is it's 600 pages long, and uh, maybe occasionally they got exhausted. But what the goal of the book was to separate the wheat from the chaff, the myth from the realities from myths, the nonsense and the and the conspiracy theories from the facts of the matter. It's an act of journalism, and, an act, and, and a journalism that took place, um, and I hope to get it out while Obama was still in office. Believe it or not, not for commercial reasons, but as part of the project itself, part of knowing a president and a president's life as best one can while he was in office. And here we are, a year and a half into the presidency, and what has sunk in? Over 20% of the American public believe that Barack, Barack Obama is a Muslim, as if there were anything wrong with that, believe that he's a Muslim. We still, any audience that I go to, or very often, I'm still asked about birth certificates, was he really born in Hawaii? Um, in other words, the very fact of his existence, his national existence, is brought under serious question despite all uh, the necessary and requisite proof otherwise. Haley Barber, who uh, distinguished himself actually during Katrina, one of very few politicians who did, was interviewed recently, and it's maybe not by mistake that he's mentioned as a possible presidential candidate in a couple of years. Uh, he said that Barack Obama was somehow remains mysterious, that we don't know very much about Barack Obama. Rush Limbaugh plays this violin all the time. Glenn Beck, I needn't tell you, plays this violin. And recently, Dinesh D'Souza, conservative intellectual you probably know, has come out with an article in Fortune magazine prefatory to a book that's coming 
um, and proposes that Barack Obama sees the world through a post-colonial Kenyan point of view. And this is a view endorsed by, as brilliant, by yet another possibility for uh, the presidency, Newt Gingrich. And I think it is too polite to distinguish these theories and these points of view with anything more than the most harsh answer. The fact of the matter is, Obama's born, we, Ob Barack Obama's life hides in plain sight, as does his ideology. He's a man of the center left. He is somebody born where he says he's born, very much had the life he says he has. Um, does he know people that were way to the left of him? Yes. Does he know people and, and learn from people way to the right of him? In law school, he studied both with Charles Fried and Roberto Unger. That didn't make him a Brazilian socialist, and that didn't make him a, a right-wing Republican in, in the mold of Charles Fried. He's somebody that read the books of Richard Posner and was a research assistant for a, a great liberal constitutional scholar. This doesn't make him them. His associations do not make him them. And yet, for political reasons, um, certain intellectuals, certain politicians, certain media outlets, and myriad websites continue to play this tune. I referred earlier, and I'll make this a, a concluding point, I referred earlier to the genre of African American uh, autobiography. One of the distinguishing features of slave narratives is that slaves wrote to prove their literacy, their personhood, their independence, and yet they had to have very often the books endorsed by white abolitionists. If you look at the title page of Frederick Douglass's autobiography, it has a gesture from William Lloyd Garrison saying this book was actually written by, believe it or not, by Frederick Douglass. That's where we were in the 19th century. And yet, on the internet, on Rush Limbaugh, and elsewhere, there cropped up the theory that Barack Obama wasn't even capable of writing the book that he, that he wrote. We heard theories that Barack Obama was not the author of his own biography, but who was its author? Wait for it. Bill Ayers. Well, if this were just one little isolated website, it wouldn't be worth distinguishing in an audience like this. But that is where we are. Barack Obama's life is still in play as a political weapon. Um, I'll stop there, and why don't we have some questions from, from the audience. Thank you. Sure. Hi, thanks. Um, is this working? Is this working? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, I mean, the, the uh, scurrilous smears that you've alluded to here are shocking. They're repellent. They're disgusting. Uh, it's a shame that this is taking place at the present time. However, it's not utterly unique in American history or American no. politics. Look at the election of 1800, the 1850s, Correct. 1930s. We could pick almost any decade uh, and find, uh, if not identical, at least somewhat comparable scurrilousness in alleged political discourse. So, um, But what distinguishes it is that he's an African American in the White House. This makes everything a little bit more electrifying. Uh, this makes everything a little bit more um, pointed. So when we hear rhetoric like, we want to take our country back, when we hear rhetoric directed at Obama and his otherness and the mystery of his background and the very purposeful fudging, uh, at best, uh, of the facts of the matter, uh, it takes on a, uh, an outsized uh, importance and an outsized danger, I'd say. Yes. I just wanted to ask you, did you get any input or any comments from President Obama himself from this book? Yeah, I interviewed Barack Obama, both uh, before he was president and in the White House. But I, I should say, that was great, that was nice, it certainly didn't hurt, but that's not where the good stuff comes from, as a biographer and as a journalist. The good stuff comes from spending a couple of days with somebody who spent a couple of years going to McDonald's and being in endless boring meetings and being a community organizer with him. 
that's where the good stuff tends to come. Uh, for example, you know, by, at this time, at this point, an interview with, with Obama is very uh, slowed down, purposeful, deliberate, uh, the goal of which is to be somewhat informative, but also to make no false steps. And there are obvious political reasons for that. I don't blame him. Yeah. Hi. Um, the August 30th issue of The New Yorker contains a puzzling piece of commentary that I was hoping you could help me understand. Uh, a man looks up at the judge who will decide his case, and the judge says, small potatoes is no defense. Could you explain this to me? I, I can't hear. I, it was the, the car, a cartoon where... Uh, oh, I don't want to get into cartoon explanation. Uh, okay. You know, at the, at the end of the year, we, we, have a, 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 um, we have a cartoon section in the special cartoon issue that comes out in November, and it's called I Don't Get It. And we, we ourselves published cartoons a second time, realizing that we maybe didn't get it in the first place. And I want to take full responsibility for that, because I'm the judge and jury. Look, I, I, it is true I was a foreign correspondent in Moscow. Very proud of that. I'm also the judge and jury on uh, New Yorker cartoons. So I, I, I bear full responsibility in whatever jail term comes with that. Yes, sir. I, I'm really curious about this Dinesh D'Souza piece that's gotten so much attention and what you make of it. Um, and first of all, of the irony that this is someone who is, you know, developing to give the intellectual gloss of, or imprimatur to these other scurrilous arguments, an argument about post-colonialism when, you know, he is too a uh, uh, son of immigrant parents from This India. whole country is post-colonial. Yeah, and, and the whole country is post-colonial. Yeah. This is exactly my Look, point. But I, I, I can't answer for Dinesh D'Souza, and I, well, I, I want to read the, the full book. Um, but I'm but asking I, this, it, this notion that somehow Obama inherited his father's ideology could, could not be farther from the truth. Obama, if anything, Obama's father was a counterexample for him, mm -hmm. a counterexample in the sense that Obama's father was um, a, a highly intelligent man, but dissolute, uh, lacking discipline, uh, in fact, blew his life up. A t you know, a really difficult man at best, uh, violent at worst, really not anything resembling what you and I would call, as they say, a family man. Uh, and ideologically, if you're gonna call somebody that's surrounded by Larry Summers and Tim Geithner, uh, and Christina Romer, et cetera, uh, uh, a post-colonial socialist, then you haven't studied hard enough. Well, then so why doesn't we, let's someone move, let's call them out on that? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I was, I was born and raised in the South. I graduated from college as a classmate with Newt Gingrich. Um, I've also lived in Hawaii in a multiracial society. And I've often wondered if Obama, who grew up in this multiracial society in Hawaii, had international uh, exposure, can he possibly understand the vitriol of Southern white anger toward him, as I can, having come from that culture? You know, I'm not a novelist. And when I say I'm not, what I mean by that is a novelist, because he or she is making it up, can go as deep as that imagination can reach. I, I think no biographer or journalist can pretend to reach that deeply. Certainly Obama has read widely in the history of race, and the history of civil rights. Um, he knows these things pr from a distance. He's also a black man in America and has felt the sting of prejudice as well as, as any black man or woman has sooner or later. No one escapes uh, uninjured in some way or another. Um, but if you read his own book, and my own reporting reflects this, growing up in Hawaii, in so-called multicultural Hawaii, even at this very elite prep school that he went to was no picnic. Why? Because there is a very prideful multiculturalism, except for one thing. There are hardly any black people there. Most of the, most of the African Americans in Oahu are on a military base. And if you read his book, and, and it, my own reporting bore this out, he, and I talked to all his black classmates, he felt the sting of prejudice as a young guy very acutely. Was it like being uh, a, a black kid in 1954 in Philadelphia, Mississippi? No but it had its own particularities. Yes, sir. Yeah, just a question. I've tried to... We don't have much time, so let's... Oh, yeah, sure, quickly so really quickly. So just, I've tried to explain for myself what I see is the president's naivete in dealing with the Republicans and his unwillingness to, to talk in terms like Franklin Roosevelt talked to during the Depression and really characterizing, as FDR did, very clearly 
uh, the deceptions, uh, the, the, uh, and, and, and laying out very explicitly his own rejections of, of the right and, and how the right was criticizing but, his but, reaction. But the and president so I'm like can't do everything, no matter how exalted the rhetoric, and it is right. curious that Obama's rhetorical capacities as president have not been always on the level of it as a campaigner, but there's a poetry prose dichotomy there that you know well. Um, in fact, this administration took off on a little mini attack on Fox News, for example. It petered out very, very quickly. Um, there is this kind of um, uh, division of people talking to themselves and riling each other up. Um, I would argue that it's more intense and um, more pernicious on one side than the other. Uh, it's, it's too polite to me to say that it's all even-handed. It's not. Um, and it's a very, very powerful thing, and it's not easily defeated or overcome. I guess, I guess my yes. question yes, was more... This will be the last question. Okay. Um, you've been a daily journalist, and you've gone to long-form magazine journalism and, uh -huh. and later a book, and the research and the writing behind all those forms is, can be quite different, although some sh shared similarities. I was wondering about the process that you go through with your, your writers um, and the editing process and how you recommend that they do their research and writing for The New Yorker. The and has process. it been influenced by your daily well, I want to make one thing very clear. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm the editor of the magazine, but I'm not the only editor at the sure. magazine. And there are extraordinary editors, uh, Henry Finder, Dorothy Wickenden, Daniel Zalewski, people you may, and, and, and more, who you may not uh, know, or you may, uh, who are extraordinarily gifted in doing what editors do. And what do they do? They try to help a writer find the way to maximize what it is and make better what it is that the writer set out to do. Not what the editor is imposing, but what the, what the, try to get inside a piece enough, and it happens through a long relationship with the writer, uh, to make that thing better. Uh, to find, to, to help, in whether it's ways structural or intellectual uh, or word by word, to um, make as beautiful and as clear uh, and as forceful uh, a piece of writing can be. So, and all people do it in different ways, and it has to do with an extension of their personalities and the intellect they bring to the table. Um, so uh, there's no one way of doing this, just as there's no one way of being a, a baseball manager or a teacher or, or any one thing. Listen, thank you all for coming out here. I know it's extraordinarily hot, and it does us all a lot of good. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.